made it happen through a lot of sacrifice and hard work. Like really studying the great producers like your Mutt Langs, like your Quincy Jones, now Rogers, your George Martins, and, and your great writers, Burt Bacharach, and Rod Temperton, and all those different people like that. And you kind of read their story, how they really just hustled and hustled, hustled, and they listened to the, the greats that was before them. They realized that it took hard work. You had to not only just listen to music, you had to study music. You had to study chord possessions. You had to really look at artists from where they are and study who they were. And you almost had to become one-on-one -on -one with them. Even if you didn't know them right away, you had to really get to know them through learning about them and, and their history. So that's what helped me to really get to, to where I am, to really study. You know, because you hear it in your head before it comes out. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because the ability to hear it in your head then translate that melody even from just humming. I remember there was a story that Barry Gordy, like Lionel Richie wanted Barry Gordy to hear a song. And so Gordy said, just hum it to me. No, I want you to hear it. He says, no, hum it to me. He says, well, why? He said, if you can hum it to me and I can remember it, then it stays in there. The melody is really permanent in there. So if it's something that even a child right. could remember, you know, the, the nursery rhymes is just a, a great blueprint of doing it. That's why they last for a few hundred years. You know, London just fall. It's just the same kind of cadence, the same kind of melodic structure works today. You know, there's a few kind of, you know, Zappa kind of things that kind of go a little left, but it's still a kind of novelty. But when it goes back to the basics of just nursery rhymes, even if a child could be able to recite it, they have a hit song. And what's great about Burt Bacharach is that he, he would take an artist like Dionne Warwick, and he would split like... Two four 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 three four, you know, and, and it was great how it went there, but it all makes it all made sense, right? You know, do you know the way to San Jose? I mean, it's like it's great, you know, um, or the great songs like Alfie. So what I encourage a lot of songwriters and producers is that you have to go back to go forward because if you have no history, you have no story to tell. Because if you go just a couple of years back, then really that's really nothing at all. Because blueprint and your foundation are your forefathers. I mean, even you go back to Gershwin yeah. and all the how he fused show tunes and jazz together. I think if you're going to get into business as a producer and writer, you really know everything about it. And that way you'll have longevity. Just like when you look at the throwback on High School Musical. Right. Nothing but really grease, you know? And how it was great because, you know, the writers like Ray Cham and all that, Andrew Sweeney and all that and Drew Steely, I'm sorry, they were great writers. And they brought me a product that I was able to produce and put together like a musical, except what we did from the B5 point of view is that we made it a little more hip hop. So more like the urban crowd coming to the Disney market too, because if you notice, there is a, there's an opening for that, for an urban, it's really clean and it really promotes a good way, of still saying things without being corny at all. Right. You know what I mean? And yeah. if you have good, clean music, a good branding, a great product. I mean, High School Musical was on the charts for over two years. And that's a great point because if I said a word, a name Jerry Hay, right. people would be like, who is that? But Jerry Hay was part of a group called Sea Wind that was really just a phenomenal group. Mm -hmm. But later, Jerry ended up doing horn arrangements for Off the Wall, right. the Thriller Records, and all that. And that's what's different from today. We have to realize that the reason why you had great monster records is that you had a great team assembled to make it happen. And today what's going on today is that it's more producer driven, more than artist driven or writers driven. Yeah. So if everybody's up here, then really who's doing work? That's a good question because to have an element you have to, well, timing is very important too, knowing about current events. I mean you look at how that when Marvin Gaye did what's going on, it was like the height of the Vietnam War and all these things happening, the civil rights movement. So someone who's really time sensitive to what's going on to what's going on in the world today, that's a great hook. Also you look around you and you see what people are not really singing about it, and that gives you a gauge for what can't sing about. You know, because it's like you're copying different things. And also you can talk about, you know, like when it comes to relationships, maybe instead of just singling out to like a one-on-one -on -one platonic relationship, make it a universal song. Like when Debbie Boone did Light Up My Life, You Light Up My Life, she was really talking about God, 
But most people thought it was talking about a relationship or just like butterfly kisses, you know. It was, it was a, a universal lyric that comes along that makes this melody just comes out and makes it really happen. So looking at all those things as a writer, just looking at current events, talking about things that people can relate to, it's, it's really a great blueprint for writing a great song. Well, definitely letting the song breathe because so many times you can have too much instruments, too many things going on. And if you do, then the lyric doesn't have a chance to stand out. So as a producer, you try not to put so much in the kitchen sink that it just drowns out the melody and the integrity of the song. And that's why we go back to country music. Guitar, bass, fiddle, still guitar. And you have your basic elements there. And it allows your song to breathe and it allows that story to be told. And what happens a lot of times as a producer, you want to kind of experiment, but you have to know when to hold back to. And we get the song breathe and hold back, and then it gives that lyric, that expression to come out to tell that story. Right. You know. Now, unless you know, you did have songs like Frankenstein in the '70s and stuff that kind of lend, you know, lend itself to more of an instrumental kind of thing. But when you're doing lyrics and you have to put the melody in it, you have to know when to stop and put it together and let the song breathe. And that's why I have to really, because sometimes we go back and listen to a song, we say, okay, let's pull this out and pull this out. And that way, lyric, you get a chance, because that lyric kind of clashes with maybe with the string line coming in there. So we'd rather pull the string out and let the lyric have its time, because that's what people are going to be listening to. Right. Not going to be humming a string line, you know, yeah. maybe in an instrumental part, but if we're writing lyrics, the lyrics have to stand out. That's a good point, because you look at, you know, maybe Phil Spector, who had the wall of sound, but that was part of his, but he still created that space for the lyric to come out and everything. And so that's what we have to really look at as producers. Just because we have the technology and have the tracks, no mean we have to use it and fill it up, you know, fill up every inch of the song. We still have to use discipline and put it together. Yeah, because you have nowhere to go. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, I, I heard enough pretty soon, you know, air fatigue. You know, you're you're done with the song within you know 20 seconds. I mean, like I had enough, but like you said, when you go back to all those great songs, like when a man loves a woman, sitting on the dock of the bay, it's just so stock and just so empty. But it leaves it a chance to grow. It leaves it a chance to grow. And by the time the end of the song, you're all in this song. You know, you felt like it taking you to it's taking you to a place that wow, it's taking it's taking me on a journey. You know what I mean? Right. It's like you said. You can go on a journey with the song. It's like just getting in there, okay, and you're there. But how much more is it where you can really appreciate the ride and the scenery around you? And then when you finally get there, it felt like you actually went somewhere to get to that place. And the same thing with songs. And that's a great point because back then, your B-sides were A-sides. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And today, a B-side is really a, a B-side. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, where did this come from? Back then, they took that craft and said, Look, if it's a B-side, you just don't know. And you never know if that DJ back then is going to, by mistake, put it on the wrong side, and all of a sudden it you know, it catches a wave. And you just wrote, and you produced something that was great because you never knew what was going to take off. That's what we do as a, as a company. With Sonic Chaos, we take the time to develop artists. You know, it might take a year, it might take a year or two. But we want to get them prepared because when you build an artist, you want to build an artist for life. Like Barry Gordy did, you know, Michael is still around, Stevie is still around, The Temptations, what's left of them are still around, Diana Ross, Smokey. And you're able to take those artists, 